Flo Hyman had always been a tall girl. I mean, really tall. By her 12th birthday, she was already six feet, and by 17, she'd topped out at just over 6'5". Initially self-conscious about her stature, she learned to use it to her advantage when she started playing volleyball. She attended the University of Houston as the school's first female scholarship athlete, and at the age of 21, she was competing in the World Championships. Nine years later, she made it to the 1984 Olympics and helped her team win the silver medal. After the Olympics, Hyman moved to Japan, where she gained fame playing professional volleyball, but all of that ended in 1986, when out of nowhere, she she collapsed and died during a game. She was 31 years old. Hyman's initial cause of death was thought to be a heart attack, but an autopsy revealed that she died from a tear in her aorta, caused by an undiagnosed condition known as Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is a genetic disorder of the connective tissue. People suffering from it have a defect in their connective tissue that substantially weakens it over time. And you got connective tissue pretty much everywhere in your body, so it could cause some big problems. Outwardly, those with Marfans tend to be especially tall and thin, like Flo Hyman, with loose, flexible joints and noticeably longer limbs and fingers. Those long fingers and bendy joints have actually helped some athletes and musicians do things that the rest of us can't. Famous blues guitarist Robert Johnson, piano virtuoso Sergei Rachmaninoff, and Italian violinist Niccolo Paganini are all believed to have had Marfan syndrome. But these abilities come at a great cost. As people with Marfans get older, their weakening tissue can cause serious problems in the joints, eyes, lungs, and heart. The fact that a single genetic mutation can affect your bones, cartilage, tendons, blood vessel walls, and more shows that all of these structures are closely related no matter how different they may seem. We've covered the basic properties of nervous, muscle, and epithelial tissue, but we haven't gotten to the most abundant and diverse of the four tissue types, our connective tissue. This is the stuff that keeps you looking young, makes up your skeleton, and delivers oxygen and nutrients throughout your body. It's what holds you together in more ways than one. And if something goes wrong with it, you're in for some havoc. And that means we're going to be talking about Jell-O today. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. To be that close to your dream, that close to the moment, which will define you professionally and reward you personally, and then to be told your life is in danger. Isaiah Austin lived that reality two years ago at the NBA draft, from a sure shot first round selection to the sidelines, except, except things may have changed. First though, the pain of the separation. I grew up fantasizing about becoming an NBA player. I felt like I had something to prove to everybody who doubted me. Because who can play basketball with one eye? I just worked my tail off to become the best player, and I wanted to make it to the NBA so bad. I just sat and just thought about walking across the NBA stage to shake the commissioner's hand. With the next pick in the 2014 NBA Draft, the combine was May 14th. Only 60 players in the world get invited and I was one of them. That was a huge step and a, a huge accomplishment. Get up, get up. People started giving me great feedback and you know, they started you know, rallying behind me. I thought it meant that I was for sure gonna be a first round pick. Gotta remain contacted on the board. Touch your board, there you go, there you go. We did the physical testing with day two of the combine. Seven feet, four and a half. They were doing a lot of my limb testing. Last name was Austin. They saw that I had stretch marks across my chest and I had very extremely long limbs for my body and a little bit of uh, indentation in my chest. But it was at the conditioning part of the testing where they found out that my heart was a little bit irregular. There were some abnormalities in the anatomy of the heart. Um, the aorta was enlarged. I indicated that we needed to do one final test, and that was a, a blood specimen to determine the gene that might be a marker of Marfan syndrome. Was that? It's quite dangerous for someone with Marfan syndrome to play basketball. There could be a, a sudden cardiac arrest, rupture of the aorta, and death could occur on the court. 
And I remember five days before the draft, I'm driving home from work and getting the call from the NBA doctor saying Isaiah tested positive for Marfan's. And I was stunned. How are we gonna tell this kid? Like, how, how can we do it? We packed up our kids and drove nine hours to, to Dallas, and he didn't know we were coming. Just remember looking my, at my mom and just asked her, I was like, is it what I think it is? And her head just went down. It was like I just blacked out. I didn't want to believe it. You know, finally when the NBA is within my grasp, it was just like ripped away from me. He thought, well, as difficult as a time this is in his life, maybe he'd still like to be with all of us in New York for the draft. Realizing that my name wasn't about to be called, it really just dawned on me that my life was really changed. Welcome to the 2014 NBA Draft. Before we continue tonight, I want to take a moment to recognize Baylor Center, Isaiah Austin. We hadn't rehearsed it. I was thinking, all right, just like hold it together. Like the other young men here tonight, Isaiah committed himself through endless hard work and dedication. I heard Adam Silver say, with the next pick in the 2014 NBA draft, the NBA selects Isaiah Austin from Baylor University. My dream did come true. I was getting choked up, and I think at that moment realized the magnitude of it. We were whispering to each other, he just whispered in my ear that, you know, I'll be a part of the NBA family forever. If that made you feel good, we'll consider the news from last night that Isaiah Austin's medical condition has improved. He joins me now on the phone. Isaiah, welcome. Tell me about the, the news you've gotten from your, your medical folks. Well, uh, you know, over the past two years, I've been um, getting checked on, you know, uh, fairly regularly by my doctor, David Liang, who's out of Stanford University, and uh, he's a Marfan specialist. And, uh, you know, what he concluded is that uh, I still have Marfan disease. It's just that um, over me being evaluated over the last couple of years and through his findings, um, he concluded that there is an acceptable level of risk for me, um, which led to him writing my clearance letter. So you're going to have to change your route, um, but there's also always a way to keep positive. There's always a way to surround yourself by the right people, and there's always a way, you know, to, to keep moving in the right direction. We strive to help people dream again, and at the same time, we raise and, and build the awareness for Marfan's syndrome. If you just look where I started from, I started in the eighth grade and had a retina tear. I had four emergency surgeries and lost my vision by the time I was a junior in high school. I wasn't supposed to be able to still play basketball. By the time I was a senior, I graduated. Um, top three in my class, you know, uh, in the country. I had my choice to go to any university I wanted to go to to play basketball. 
I chose to go to Baylor University because it was a Christian school and it was close to home. I knew that I can grow uh, not only as a ball player, but as a man, most importantly. Um, when I decided I wanted to come out after my freshman year, uh, I tore my shoulder in a workout, you know, just randomly. So I ended up coming back to Baylor. Um, I shared my story. Nobody knew that I was playing blind in my right eye. I shared my story with the world and just the impact that I had was so, with so many people around the world, it, it just inspired me to want to inspire more and more people. So.